Welcome to the Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Filmmaker Podcast, hosted by Charles Aline and Dr. Christopher C. Odom. On this episode, we speak with filmmaker Sharice Keys. We discuss what it was like producing her first short film, as well as her role as a post-production coordinator at the George Lucas-founded and now Disney-owned Industrial Light and Magic, working on the biggest projects in Hollywood, including Marvel's The Eternals, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, and the upcoming new Star Wars Disney Plus streaming series, Ashoka. This episode is sponsored by the Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival, which is dedicated to ensuring that Caribbean and Latino filmmakers have a voice that's heard and a wide audience to showcase their work. To welcome everyone to our podcast. Um, like I said, we've been this podcast has been doing really well. I continue to w- see how it grows, and I'm really excited. And today we have a special guest, filmmaker, a young filmmaker. Her name is Sharice Keys. I'm going to introduce you to Sharice and let her um, tell you a little bit about herself. Hey, Sharice, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, go ahead. Tell us a little bit about your yourself. All right, um, I'm from New York, and um, my mom is from Barbados. That's my Caribbean connection to this film festival. Um, and my dad grew up here. Um, I went to New York University for a master's degree um, in specialized studies, where I concentrated in television and film. And um, Tempting Torment, which is in this festival, is the first film that I've ever directed. Um, and I'm currently working as a production coordinator at Industrial Light and Magic. Wow, that, that's 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 amazing. I mean, you're really working hard there. You, do you have time <laughs> for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> oh my god! What are you like? What are you putting in a twenty-hour day um, shift over there? Um, when the film is coming towards its deadline, you are putting in quite a lot of time—sixty hours or more. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. All right, so let's talk about your your short, um, Tempting Torment. What is that all about? And just give us like, you know, what was the genesis for it and how you approach uh, directing your actors and the, the whole nine? Um, yeah, so I was in grad school at the time and I was in a class where we had a professor who really wanted us to have like a calling card. He wanted us to be able to... Um, Sorry. Okay. (laughs) He wanted us to be able to um, have something that we could show to other people. And so I started writing this script because at the time um, I was dating, my best friends were dating, and it was just like really difficult, um, the whole dating process. It always seemed like you got your hopes up and things just never panned out right. And I was just hearing horror story after horror story. And I also noticed that during that time, I was doing like a lot of reflection after every bad thing that happened. I would start thinking about like the things that I've seen women in my family go through in their relationships. I started thinking about like, I wonder why I'm taking things so incredibly personally. And it made me um, reflect a lot. And so I kind of just wanted to not be so sad about the situation. And I wrote this to be cathartic in a funny way, but to also kind of like, you know, look at some of the things that were going through my mind and kind of like process some of the traumas that I had seen when I was a kid. Wow, that's 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 incredible. So now you got you you got the story, you you've mm-hmm. written the story, and what's the next step? Casting and just take us through your steps of putting the whole film, the short film together. Definitely. Um, I think for any first time director, if you don't have a lot of money, try to hit up the the acting schools as much as possible because um, a lot of kids want to just have something for their reel. And that is what I did first. And then I went on Facebook and I went on um, backstage and I made ads to see if I could get people to come in and audition. Um, and luckily I had a really cool boss. He let me use his office on the weekend to hold auditions 
and I would have people come in and that's how I got my cast. Um, the person who plays the dad in the film was actually my uncle. He's an actor, so that worked out really great. Nice. Um, and then after that, um, what I started to do was um, I came up with, uh, I actually did a drawing board where we sketched out every single scene and we wrote notes underneath to um, give to a cinematographer. Um, and then the rest of my team came from people really just in school, um, working at NYU and going to school there. I was coming in contact with people who were trying to become audio engineers, people were trying to become cinematographers, um, gaffers, and so it was really easy to find the help in that way. Um, and then once we started the once I had my crew, that's when I started rehearsing the actors. So we'd come in um, on a weekend and we would just run through the script as much as possible. And then after that, we just started shooting. Do you so, have a go? I'm sorry, Chris. Go um, ahead. Um, let, let me ask the traditional questions. Uh, uh, how long did it take to shoot and and produce the entire short? What was the budget? <laughs> And what did you shoot on? <laughs> um, I cannot remember what we shot on, to be completely honest with you. So I'm sorry about that. Altogether, it took me $3,000 to make it because I had to pay my crew. And then, you know, if you're not able to pay your actors, you have to provide food at least. And providing three meals a day um, was a lot. Um, I think it took us three days to shoot that film. and. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other question you had? And and how long did it take to produce, meaning from beginning to end after shooting, how long did it take to and post to edit it? Um, I think it took two months. Okay. The R Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival is the only combined Caribbean and Latino film festival that is Oscar qualifying for short films. So do you have a particular directing style that you favor or do you have a particular director that you um, that you like? Um, yeah, I really like Melina Masukas. She directed, um, uh, sorry, it's for Slim and, I oh mean, it's, the name is, for, I'm blanking on the name, but she also directed like a lot of episodes of Insecure. She's directed a lot of Beyonce's videos. She usually shoots on 75 million millimeters. Um, and mm. so I really just like um, the aesthetic of how her shots come out. Um, but from this experience, I, because I was a first time director, I defaulted to a lot of people who are more experienced. Um, and so now I kind of want to be like the way people describe Ava DuVernay, which is a velvet glove. Um, you know, you're stern, <laughs> but you're you're not being, you know, a jerk about it. <laughs> okay, that that that's cool. Okay, so you finished the film. What what happened? Did you get it into a film festival? I did. I got it into two film festivals. It was the NYU Arts Film Festival and the Sisters with Voices Film Festival. Hmm. Okay, so what was that experience with the NYU Film Festival? Um, it was really cool. They they uh, booked out a whole entire like uh, theater and, you know, you had people come in and it was enjoyable being able to hear people like laugh at your jokes or even laugh at your pain if you really want to think about it. And um, and then afterwards, they had like a QA and a and you just pretty much what I'm doing right now, you describe your whole film process and what brought you to it. Okay, so I was looking at your resume, and I noticed that you also was a um, an assistant to a showrunner. Did, yeah. How was that experience like? And could you tell us the name of the showrunner and what the you know how that whole um, being an assistant to a showrunner? What was that experience like? Definitely. Um, when you come out of grad school and you're trying to look for a job as a writer, a lot of people's advice is you just need to network as much as possible. And so what I started to do was I created this spreadsheet where I would literally just go through LinkedIn and look for anybody who had 
a writer's assistant title, a showrunner's assistant, a line producer, and I would just write down their name and then I would shoot them a message and I would say like, hey, um, I'm an aspiring screenwriter and I was just wondering if I could have your time um, to discuss how you got into the business. And Smart. I would put, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I would put away a little bit of a budget, uh, like a hundred dollars a month to be able to take that person out for like coffee or a treat because yes. people ask them those <laughs> questions constantly. And after a while they start to ignore you. And it really is a service because they're telling you, they're giving you valuable information. Like some people gave me um, resume templates so that I can know what agencies are looking for when they're looking at a resume. There were people who told me how Blacklist worked it because they, they worked for Blacklist. So um, I would always, if they weren't in New York at the time and they were like in another state, I would always send them like a Starbucks gift card just to say thank you. And that kept people in, they were like, oh, out of all the people I helped, this one person got me like a latte. And so that would keep people, keep my name in people's mind. And one person that I did that with, um, she was signing on to work as a writer's assistant for a Netflix show that was about to happen. And she said they needed a showrunner's assistant. And so I interviewed for it and I got the job. And um, working as a showrunner's assistant, it's really, it's, I recommend it in the sense that, like, if you really want to know how the business works on the back end, this will teach you a lot about it. You're in budget meetings. You're listening to, you know, the VPs of a production company tell you what's necessary for the show to keep going. Um, you're, the other half of it is that you need to be anticipatory of whoever you're hired to meet. So if they need you to run and go get lemons, you got to run and go get lemons. Um, but if they need you to also like read through a script and give them advice on it or editorial feedback, you're there for that too. Um, then because it was a Zoom room, we were, uh, we shared, it would get split up sometimes. And so there were two writers assistants, myself and another young woman. And, um, what then you're privy to is just how the writers come up with the story. Um, you're the person transcribing every bit of that. And so you see a uh, story go from start to finish. I just want to say to my audience that's listening, you're not going to get this type of information in film school. This is, this is, where, <laughs> this is where you come to, to, to learn, you know, to learn stuff. This is the place. This is the podcast. You definitely want to tune in every week to get this type of information. You're not getting this information anywhere else. <laughs> so, Have so, you only worked as a, a showrunner's assistant in the Zoom room, or did you also get a chance to work in a live room? Unfortunately, no, I didn't get that chance. Um, that show ended up not being able to be made. And so by the time they started letting people back into physical writers' rooms, I was unable to. And I had already gotten a job at Industrial Light and Magic. And so I just started moving on to there. Wow. Okay, that, that's, that's a nice segue into my next question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like working at Industrial Light and Magic? I know you're, you're there now. So what's, what's the daily grind and what's, what's expected of you? Um, I'm a production coordinator. And so basically what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that once the film goes into post, um, we're keeping that schedule going. And so we hit that deadline. So whenever, you know, Paramount or Disney wants that show to go into theaters or wants that show to go onto streaming channels, everything that's done with that episode or that film is complete. And so I manage a group of artists. Um, and it's really like, I don't know if you've ever watched the docuseries Light and Magic on Disney Plus, but that's really what it's like. It's, you're sitting in a room and you're assisting these artists and you're hearing them talk. And they're just coming up with these incredibly brilliant ways to create water in a computer, how to make dust, how to create a tornado, how to make a lightsaber. It's really just sitting there and kind of being the best support to the artist as you possibly can. 
And so to clarify, are you a post-production coordinator? I am, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, how did you go from showrunner's assistant, which is going to be sort of behind the scenes, but on the development half, to post-production coordinator? Well, uh, I had been applying to Disney for like years, and it was so hard to get a job there um, because someone had told me that if you want to be a writer, networking is such a huge part of getting that job that you need to really just try and figure out how to be in the middle of everything. So that way you can talk to as many people as possible. You can hand your script to as many people as possible. And the likelihood of you coming on as a writer's assistant or someone to write uh, or a staff writer um, is higher than if you're kind of just like shipping your script to different festivals and fellowships and things of that nature. Um, so I have been trying my darndest to get a production job. And um, while I was working as a showrunner's assistant, I actually got an interview with Disney um, and I didn't get that job, but I continuously kept in contact with the uh, woman who interviewed me. And I would tell her like, would it be okay if every time I go out for a job or put my application in, I can let you know about it? And she said, yes. And I was like tenacious about it. Every time I saw a job that I thought that I was qualified for, whether it be Lucasfilm, Pixar, Hulu, ABC, I would let her know um, down to like the job ID number. I was like, this is exactly what I applied for. And um, eventually she called me in for this job and I got it the same day that I interviewed. Este episodio está patrocinado por el Festival de Cine Latino y Caribeño Our Vision, que se dedica a garantizar que los cineastas latinos y caribeños tengan una voz que se escuche y una amplia audiencia para mostrar su trabajo. El Festival de Cine Latino y Caribeño Our Vision es el único festival de cine latino y caribeño combinado que califica para los Oscar a los cortometrajes. Cada año, Our Vision proyectará a los ganadores de las categorías de cortometrajes en vivo en los cines en ambas costas durante una semana como parte de los requisitos para la consideración del Oscar. Haga clic en el enlace en nuestro perfil ahora para enviar su película al próximo festival de cine latino y caribeño Our Vision para compartir su trabajo, llegar a su audiencia y convertir sus sueños en realidad. You have an interest in educational background. I noticed your MFA from uh, North, uh, MFA from, I'm sorry, NYU is in specialized studies with a concentration in TV and film. I wasn't familiar with that program at NYU. Is that interdisciplinary? And, and how has your MFA influenced what you're doing today at ILM? And uh, in any way, did your MFA and an MFA from NYU assist you in getting to where you are today? Uh, sure. Um, so I know a lot of people say that, like, you may not need a degree, but the reason I would say that you should push for, like, a film degree is because of the connections. It, a lot of times people want you to work towards a higher level, but I think a lot of your things will get made if you work across. You never know who you're sitting next to in class who's going to be like the next person with the next opportunity. And if you guys were already working together, then, you know, you pull each other up. So that's what I think is the great part of that. Um, the, the way that the going to NYU helped me was that I was in a class with a professor. Her name is Sherry Holman. Um, and she's written for a lot of like shows on Netflix, like Longmire. And um, in her class, I wrote a spec for the show, The Alienist. And she really liked the spec. And at the time, the woman that I ended up show running for was actually the showrunner for The Alienist. Oh. And so she had already told her that like, hey, I have this student and I was impressed by the way she, she wrote would you mind looking at her script? And so unbeknownst to me, 
they had already connected. And by the time I got to her, she already knew who I was. And so wow. that's what I mean by the connections of going to school is that there's people there that'll help you get to the next thing. Each year, our vision will screen the winners of the short film categories live in theaters on both coasts for one week as part of the requirements for Oscar consideration. It's really incredible. I, I'm, I'm hoping that my audience now are really getting the education. This is a serious education. And here's the thing, you're not paying for it. It's free. We're giving you a free <laughs> education, you know? I mean, Sharice, you're really incredible. I love your journey. I mean, the, the way how you construct your journey and how it's going, I think it's amazing. And I think it's inspirational for people who are listening out there to realize that here's a young woman who had a dream, she executed, and she's still working on it. It's, you know, she still wants to achieve what she needs to achieve. But I think that's really good. So do you have a specific, um, like, um, show that you had a really great experience that you work for, like, say, an industry like Magic? What was your... You know, like, what was the first show that you um, you worked for? Let's start with that. The first movie I ever worked on at ILM was Marvel's The Eternals. And I, when I first came on, I was just super stoked to be working on anything superhero. <laughs> it was great, like, watching all the artists create something out of nothing. Like, you, you, the smallest, most minute thing that you would never think is being made in a computer is down to someone's vet is being made. Um, it was just incredible. And um, I was only on that show for about two months before I moved on to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it's pretty good. Uh, I saw it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you guys liked it. That was for a year. Um, and that was, I was a production assistant for that one. Um, and that was just great because that was the first time I got to see the whole entire process. I sort of came in to the Eternals towards the tail end of prose production. Um, with Dungeons and Dragons, I saw all the art concepts for how like the owl bear was being created. Then I watched it move on into model and rigging and then texture and then animation. I saw effects add dust and uh, cloud, uh, dirt clods to whenever she moved. So then when it got to the compositors and she was just a full owl bear in all her glory. Um, so that was awesome. Then after that, I moved on to Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Wow. And that was a tight schedule. Um, we had to do a turnaround in like three months, uh, but it ended up coming out really great. Uh, the sequence we worked on was... Um, the probability storm where there's like a million ant-mans. And then I'd have to say the show that taught me the most was Ahsoka. I didn't fully understand what effects were needed to create a Star Wars show until I came onto that and seeing the, the setups that were created for explosions, seeing, um, how you make a lightsaber and everything that goes into it down to like sparks, that was incredible. Um, so I would say that has to be the most rewarding because it was the most hardest show to work on. Wow. Let's go a little bit granular since you only work on the biggest shows and movies there are. <laughs> <laughs> so what does your day actually look like as a, a post-production coordinator? What would you be doing on a given day? Okay, um, so you you come in and then the first thing that you want to do is you want to check in with your artists. You want to see if they have any new takes from the day before that they want to get in front of the supervisor so that they could get notes back. And you're pretty much spending the day trying to get all of that rallied into dailies. Um, they have dailies every single day. Um, and then after that, what you're doing is there are milestones where you have to hit um the client or the whoever your production studio that you're working for they're looking for someone to tell them like you're gonna have this x amount of shots for this sequence at this particular time 
And so you're then checking in with the artist to say like, hey, is there anything that you need to complete this shot? This shot is due on this such and such a day. Do you think you're still going to be able to do that? And when you have over a thousand shots, that'll take up your whole day. <laughs> wow. Did you just say a thousand shots? Yes, over the course of a film and especially um, a series, you're looking at a thousand shots or more. So do you have to go through each shot one at a time and see what the status is? <laughs> Whoa. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> and you're, you know, depending on how heavy it is, um, you know, like some shows are heavily animated and some aren't. Some are heavy effects driven and some aren't. So if you're in charge of a particular department in the pipeline, you might be managing 30 different artists, 30 different artists, a thousand shots. It's a lot of work to be managing throughout the day. Wow, did you say 30 different artists, a, a thousand shots each? Not on 30, oh. but oh. <laughs> up the same yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, ooh, that that's a traffic job. Yeah, yes, yeah. Very, very impressive that you can handle that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, top-notch project management skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what you that's that's the kind of, kind of stuff that you need to be in Hollywood. That type of um, you know, to be a good director. Like this uh director is a uh a traffic cop to tell people where yeah. to go, you know. So, I mean, that's the that's the perfect perfect um, you know, experience that you want that cuz I know you want to be a writer director. That's that's probably the next step for you. And I think this experience that you have is going to lead you to that direction. It's going to lead you to exactly what you want to go. Because you know how, you know how the what's the word? You know how it works. You know how the train station operates. So to right. speak. So as a young director, if I was studio head and your reel came across my desk and I went through your resume, I would say, Oh, wait a minute, she's she's a post-production coordinator. She understands how many shots and how many balls you have to juggle. She knows how important every second is of this special effects driven film. I, I think we should give her a shot. Oh well, you know, talk to some people from <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's what we're hoping that people who are listening to this will like, all right, let's let's get Sharice on this set, you know? I mean, she's the <laughs> one <really>. that we want. <laughs> so, I mean, it really is a great education, I think, because a lot of times when things are shot on the on the actual, like say you're trying to create a storm, there's there's a storm isn't really there. And so yeah. what's cool about <laughs> visual effects is like you're reshooting the movie all over again because everything that you intended to be there has to now get created and has to go through a whole entire process. And even down to some things with actors that they can't do, the animators become the actors and they're making the person do all the things that you wanted them to do in the shot. So that's the really cool part of it is you're, it is like film school because you're learning everything from that the book. I mean, that's, yeah, I met. Go ahead, I imagine, you know, with uh, you work on so many uh, special direct uh, effects driven films that the, what they actually shoot just might be a gray screen. Or it might right. be puppets. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they got to turn that into something. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's incredible. So you said that the last uh, project you worked was a uh, Ahsoka. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that's not out. When is that? When is that going to be on Disney Plus? That goes what? next month. Next Yay! Month. <laughs> so, so folks can get to see your work on a series. Then is, is this your first series? Right? Correct. No, I worked on um, Hawkeye. Oh, I, I loved it. <laughs> oh, great! I'm glad it was a great show to work on. Um, especially what was really cool about it was we were still in the midst of the pandemic, and it was just incredible to see what they were able to accomplish without actual sets because they couldn't film. I mean, to um, you, you worked on every single big blockbuster there is. Is, <laughs> is there anything that you haven't worked on? I mean, by <laughs> if I could, but no. I'm hoping next time around I get to you. <laughs> That's my dream is to work for Ryan Coogler for Proximity Media would be because he's a great 
more than just being a great director, he's also a really great producer and screenwriter. I, I suppose when Ryan Coogler was younger, his dream was to work for somebody like he is today. Right, right. <laughs> that's 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 really cool. So, what what's next? Uh, what are you are you are you uh, assigned to a show already or something? What's next for you? Um, yes, I'm assigned to a show already. We're really not supposed to talk about anything okay. until they start to do promotion. Right. So, we will respect um, that. We will respect <laughs> that. We will respect that. So um, as a post-production coordinator for ILM who goes from project to project, do you have mm-hmm. downtime where there's no project and you're, you know, just kind of kicking it at home? Or do they just keep you employed continuously? Um, you know, they try to keep you going from project to project. That's the goal to always get have people moving from one place to the next. So no downtime unless you schedule it. Um, <laughs> the vacation time. <laughs> yeah, you just keep going from the next to the next. So are you writing anything for yourself? Like, um, um, go ahead. Definitely. On the side, I'm still trying to get my stuff into fellowships and um, different contests. And um, I'm currently writing um, a pilot about a woman who left New Orleans for Harlem to create, um, to open up her own restaurant. It's slightly based on my great grandmother. Oh, what what is it set? What period? What time period is it set in? Um, it's set in the 1950s, but it also flashes forward to um, show. It's sort of like her life and her granddaughter's life are moving in parallel. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that, thank you so much, uh, Sharice, for sharing and for teaching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Click the link in our profile now to submit your film to the next Our Vision Caribbean and Latino Film Festival to share your work, reach your audience, and turn your dreams into reality.